Dr. Forrest with us today. Uh, he's actually around for the whole week, so if you have questions, he's sitting in the visitor office on the fifth floor. It's hard to escape from there. In cash um, and today he will tell us about uh, his work on heterotic moduli space metrics. Alright, so thank you very much, Larry, and thank you much for allowing me to come and complete the Chicago contingent that have recently arrived. Um, <coughs> just like old times. So today I'm going to tell you about how to use a laser pointer. Um, some work with Davis and Della Oster in Oxford on writing down modular space metrics in the handle industry. Um, so this is some work we've been doing for a little while now. We the reason it's not published is, as you've seen in the penultimate slide, there's, there's, a, there's an exercise for the reader. Um, so. I don't need to give this slide to some of you, but maybe for the others. Oh, geez. Okay. So that says why heterotic. Um, <clears throat> so why would you want to study the heterotic stream? So I think, you know, for me the, the, the most interesting thing is it's a really controlled way to understand quantum corrections and string theory. So you can write down um, uh, compactifications. You have a well cheap description. Um, you might be able to then understand alpha prime corrections in that situation. And you don't need to appeal to sort of non perturbative stringy type objects like oriental fault planes, deep brains, and So it's a, it's a very nice controlled setting. Um, it also has a very nice interaction with geometry, so you might be able to then use the heterotic string to understand things about the geometry of moduli space and sort of vector models. So that sounds impressive. Um, don't use it at the time. <coughs> You mean so, mathematics benefit from us more, or we benefit from mathematics? Uh, they, they would benefit, well, <laughs> hopefully both ways. Okay. But primarily, very little is understood about um, uh, the mathematics of vector bundles on, say, Clavier platforms. So the mathematicians really know a lot about curves, but not the problems. So, so here is a little cartoon about picture. So this says, what is a heterotic compactification? Um, and I've, I've this, this cartoon essentially appeared in my thesis, and I've been using it ever since. Um, so the situation is you have a large radius compactification, some Minkowski space time, some internal Clavier geometry, uh, which I denote by M, and on that geometry you stick a vector bundle. That vector bundle has a connection or a gauge field A, and it can do all sorts of things. Um, it can't do anything at once, it needs to solve the equations of motion which can be sort of encapsulated in two lines in this way. So the first tells you that the, the metric on the Clavier must be rigid flat. The next two tell you that this bundle is holomorphic. So with respect to the complex structure of this Clavier, the 0, 2, and 2, 0 components must vanish. And the final one is that the Himschenegger Mills equation must be satisfied. So um, in addition, you have to uh, solve the Bianchi identity. So this tells you that the classification would be anomaly free. Okay, so given that data, this ten, sort of ten-dimensional data, you then might want to start to understand things about the dynamics in this effect of four-dimensional space-time. Okay, so uh, you can do this by a variety of means. The way that I'll be primarily doing is by dimensional reduction. So that is, I, I, I take this data and I integrate over the Clavier to get some effective theory in four dimensions. And my theory will always have n equals 1 supersymmetry, so you, know, you can schematically write it in um, this form. That is in n equals 1 supersymmetry. Okay, so, questions? <coughs> Just get ourselves warmed up so we're all on the same page. <coughs> um, so, given that compactification, you know, so that's some nice geometric setting, you then have this geometries within geometries, so that compactification has a set of parameters, that pr those parameters form a, a geometry by themselves, a parameter space, and it might be interesting to study what that parameter space is. Okay, so that'll tell you how uh, the, the family of these compactifications vary as you vary the parameters. So for example, the most well understood situation is what's called the standard embedding. So that's where you choose a very specific type of vector bundle that you, you identify with your tangent bundle. And in that case, the parameter space splits into a space of metric deformations. And those metric, sorry, 
Prima space is the space of metric deformations. Those metric, metric deformations split into uh, complex structure deformations and complex bicalar deformations. Okay, so this is been very well understood for at least 20, uh, 20 odd years. Uh, it exhibits very nice special, uh, properties such as special geometry and mirror symmetry. Um, but from the point of view of the heterotic string, it's a very non generic thing to do. So in the heterotic string, remember we've got this picture of Quabia manifold with a bundle. So we want to deform not just this space here, but also this thing on top. In particular, I can fix M and just think about deforming the deformations of the vector. Any deformation that preserves the local yeah, the, equations, the data. equations in motion. That's all. Uh, globally, you don't have. Any, do you preserve anything else? Uh, as long as you preserve um, the Bianchi identity and the equations motion. That's all you're imposing. Yeah. And so the manifold M does not have to be smooth, or you could have singularities and all that stuff. You could have singularities. I'll be thinking okay. about just smooth space. Okay. But So, so here's a little cartoon. Right, so this red line is what we understand. We've got question marks everywhere else. So in particular, so, so these are deformations of the standard embedding. So you're looking at taking the, the tangent bundle and just deforming the bundle a little bit. Uh, but you could also have, for example, compactifications that are not connected to the standard embedding. Can you define rank for us here? Uh, sorry, yeah, so rank is the rank of the vector bundle. So um, uh, these would be SU3 bundles, SU4, SU5. This would give you an E6 gauge theory, mm -hmm. SO10, SU5. Excuse me. Yeah? Embedding of what? It's the standard embedding. So you, um, <coughs> so you have this gauge field. And I'm about to describe this actually. So you have this gauge field, and you need to solve these complicated set of equations. One way of solving that is to say I'm going to um, identify that gauge field with the spin connection. Okay, so because this is a club out threefold, that then gives you an SU3 vector bundle. This, the tangent bundle is an SU3 vector bundle. So you need the SU3. That's what you call that, That's okay. called the standard vector. Embed the spin connection in the So you mean the holonomy in the SU3 group is the subgroup of the of the engaged group EA? Yes. 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 And then uh, if you're looking at what's so the commutant of that SU3 into the A is E6, and that's why you have an E6 sketch there. So here your rank is straight rank forward, so rank of the for which group? For the that's the rank of the bundle, so it's a depend so it's a vector bundle. Okay, so for the group. Uh, no, so the holonomy group here would be rank two, but here we're looking at three-dimensional fibers. And so it's the rank, it's the rank of the vector bundle. Okay. So it's just saying the tangent space is, is three complex dimensions. Okay, so. Here are our goals. We're interested in pursuing. So here are two goals. One, we want to ask a question. Given given this this, this compactification data, how do we construct the four-dimensional effective field theory? And two, given that, what can we understand about parameter space geometry? So, for example, is there a natural metric you can put on the parameter space? That's the key question. How does that information help us understanding the effective action? How does it appear in the effective action? That metric you were just referred to. So I'll, I'll describe we'll that. We'll discuss that. Later. Okay. It'll appear uh, in essentially the determines uh -huh. of effective action. Okay. For massless scale fields, massless neutral scale fields. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So before we get on to you know, the interesting stuff, let's remind ourselves how. Uh, the old story worked. And by the old story, I mean the space of metric deformations. So, to do that, we look at the standard embedding. So, this is what I was saying before. We identify our 
gauge connection here with the spin connection to the clock out. That gives us then an E6 gauge theory with some minimal amount of supersymmetry. And uh, you can then ask, given that, what are the space and massless definitions? So I, can do, I really only have two things to deform. One is the metric, and the other is the B field. It turns out you can do that in two different ways. The first is to deform the complex structure of the Clark Bia manifold. And so these turn out to be uh, um, the, the tangent space <coughs> of these deformations turns out to, uh, to be identified with H1 M valued in T. So that means 2 comma 1 forms of the Clark Bia manifold. And the second way is to deform the Kähler structure of the convexification. So by that I mean you can change the volume of the Clavier manifold together with some component of the field. And so these form some nice uh, complex combination, which are then identified with one one forms. Okay, so the moduli space has a tangent space, which is essentially the, the, the product of these two cohomology groups. Okay, so Given this, so, so just to explain the notation, so chi here are basis of forms for this cohomology group. The z's here are parameters, so I can choose them to be whatever I like. Uh, similarly, t here are parameters, and the omegas form a basis for this cohomology group. So we just expanded this arc element of this cohomology group in a basis and used that to set up a coordinate system. So the nice thing about this situation is it then gives you a nice collusion Klein ansatz with which to start the dimension reduction. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you take your parameters and you promote them to dynamical fields in space-time. You should sort of wait. Okay, so uh, I just take my parameter here and I, I get some dependence in space-time. The same thing, so these are the complex structure, this is complex by Kähler. And I take that and I just plug it into the action and integrate over the Clavier manifold. And what do you get? Well, you get a bunch of terms, and the, the, the terms that are of interest are the kinetic terms for the scalar fields. And so the, these guys, essentially like the nonlinear sigma model, so they'll have some uh, nonlinear metric piece, nonlinear kinetic term whose coefficients give you the metric on the parameter space. Okay, so the, uh, the complexified Kähler guys here have a metric G sub Rs, and you can write that metric in terms of an integral over the Clark out space. So for this guy, these guys, this is the natural inner product of this harmonic form, uh, of these two harmonic forms, omega sub R and omega sub X. So, uh, so you have four dimensions, I think, just start from the left-handed dimension now, normal parameters are and then you will Yep. Here you didn't consider the gauge parameter test in there. That's right, yeah, exactly. So what we're going to do is complete this by including engagement. Yeah. I noticed that in one of your equations you had uh, Lorentz Chern Simon modified field yes. strength U. Yes. Yes. Uh, but that's a higher derivative correction to supergravity theory. Yes. And it has, normally it has partners. I mean, it's not just Lorentz and Simon term. So Why is it that you ignore all the partners of that and you only look at R minus half A square? So I'll discuss this a little bit more when I come to the gauge field. But so in heterotic, heterotic has the nice property that um, the action can be completely written down up to terms that are alpha prime cubed. And all you need to do is include, include the Lorentz and Simon's term in H uh, with the appropriate term in the action and compute certain um, curvature terms with the twisted spin connection. What do you mean higher derivative curvature terms or which curvature terms? So, so in the action you'll have um, a trace R plus squared where R plus is computed with respect to uh, the spin connection plus the combination. But that will be new terms that are outside, besides this R minus yes. A so, square. Right, so I'm going to be doing a dimension reduction to zeroth and then first order in alpha prime. I see. Which those terms will be suppressed. I see, okay, okay. But so you, you could then 
ask the question, what, how do alpha prime corrections modify these considerations? Which in heterotic you might have a chance of getting at because you know uh, what the action is up to this to alpha prime. So I'll be more careful about this later on, but... I'm sorry, but your embedding omega is equal to A yeah. means that you're cancelling R H R against F H F in yeah. the Bianchi identity. Yeah. But they are coming in a different order. So aren't you mixing order, alpha okay. prime orders, in right, so balancing those two guys? Um, right. So So we have depends how you want to write it. So if you want to write it as a Bianchi identity. Mm -hmm. right, so here is the supergravity information. Then you have anomaly cancellation tells you that essentially this is true. Okay, so you can't, it, it, it's very hard to separate these two terms um, if you want an anomaly free theory. But if you can't separate them from each other, why is it that you can separate the uh, higher derivative interactions or the bio order in alpha prime. So I'm going to be working to linear order in alpha prime. So I'll be including both of these terms. Okay. So in particular, so far what I've written here, this doesn't even enter because I'm just looking at dB and H. So this is plus alpha prime, or alpha prime. Any other question? Okay, so okay, so so uh, this 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 theory here has n equals one supersymmetry and d equals four. So in particular, that tells you this these metrics are Kähler. Indeed, write down a Kähler potential, which is the integral of uh, the Kähler form uh, cubed for for the Kähler guys. Complex structure guys, it's the integral of the holomorphic three form together with its complex conjugate over the Clavier manifold. And then you have these nice properties, which I mentioned before, uh, that the special geometry and mirror symmetry can actually fix for you this effective field theory. Um, so, given, given that little history lesson, what we want to do is study um, what how those considerations change when you include, include deformations of. The gauge bundle. So what we're going to do, just to where where everything is nice and, and uh, understood, well, not, not understood, but the nicest possible situation you can imagine is to take the standard embedding and then look at small fluctuations around. That. Okay. So in that case, you know that the moduli space is the sum of Kähler deformations of the Clavier together with complex structure deformations of the Clavier together with some uh, bundle deformation. So what is known about this moduli space? Well, um, so schematically, if you split the effective field theory into D terms plus F terms, you know how to compute at least some of the F terms using single model techniques. But very little is understood about the Kähler potential. So what we're going to do is try and understand how to compute these D terms, at least perturbatively enough. So, so that's going to be our goal, is to say, uh, let me fix some background, study the small fluctuation analysis around that background, uh, and use that to, to write down an effective field theory. And within that effective field theory, we'll have a, a modular space metric. And so we're going to do this in three steps. Um, first is to fix a club out. And so we're not going to worry about the deformations of the underlying space. And then just look at the space of bundle deformations. Then we're going to allow the parameters of the complex structure of the Clavier to vary together with bundle deformations. Write down the effective field theory for that. And finally allow everything to vary. So, okay, so let's start with the first step. The first step is to fix the Clavier, so it's this fixed Clavier. Um, and to, before I do this, I need to introduce some notation. Okay, so I take my 
H in action, which is anti-emission, and I write it in the sum of a 0, 1 component here and a 1, 0 component here, and then study the small deformations of this space. And what I need to do is to figure out a convenient parameterization for these small fluctuations. Okay, so this is really the analog of the parameters that I was writing down before for the metric deformations. Okay. So let me do this by just saying, okay, so suppose there are some parameters that describe this space of deformations. And then I um, want to figure out the relation between those parameters and these, these small deformations. So the first guess is to just simply tailor expand. So fix some background and then just look at small fluctuations. In that case, you're led to identify this small fluctuation with um, the partial derivative of A with respect to that parameter. That turns out to be not a good thing to do. First of all, this guy here isn't closed. So it's not an element of this cohomology group, so it's not actually a small fluctuation a massless fluctuation. Um, and secondly, it's not consistent with the gauge symmetry theory. So you're allowed to shift A, uh, for example, by background gauge transformations in this fashion. If you do so, then a partial derivative transforms in this very non-homogeneous way. Can't you have a covariant expansion scheme of sort? Uh, so, yeah, that's, so the next, the, okay. that's, that's the next line. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, it's a matter of finding out what that covariant derivative oh, okay. Okay, so you want to do a bit better than just partial derivatives. And there's a bit of inspiration we had by looking at um, just sort of going back to the complex structure moduli space. So in the complex structure moduli space, you have this holomorphic three form. And it also has a type of gauge symmetry. So it's, it's, that's fancy language, it's a section of a line bundle over the moduli space. So that tells you that you're allowed to shift this three form by uh, non zero complex numbers. And that's a function then of the parameters in moduli space. <clears throat> and indeed, that should tell you that you can uh, write down this basis in terms of the series of covariant derivatives. So Kadara showed that you can write these two one forms, which were our basis elements for H1, in terms of derivatives of omega. Okay. So it's just a partial derivative. And you introduce this type of connection case of alpha, which transforms under this shift by, by lambda in the appropriate fashion. And so that then allows you to write down a covariant derivative. Uh, and in fact, it can be very nicely related to the Cayley potential on that moduli space. Okay, so, so the point is, um, even in the complex structure case, you had a type of gauge symmetry that you needed to take into account. And you did that by introducing covariant derivatives. And that then allowed you to expand H1 in terms of covariant derivatives. So, sort of inspired by that, what we're led to do is then introduce the connection on the moduli space for these bundle deformations. And it has the property that it transforms in a particular way. Okay. That then allows you to define the covariant derivative for acting on this gauge field. And it is Once you do so, you discover that uh, it has a nice property under uh, gauge transformations, and furthermore, that it's closed. So you're led to uh, uh, define. So you're led. You're led then to expand the appropriate cohomology group in these in these covariant derivatives. Uh, what's the meaning of d bar partial bar sub a? Ah, uh, that's that's uh, yeah. So that's just the that's the covariant derivative with respect to a. So let me mm -hmm. let me just write. It. Actually, so it doesn't give anything me any really. One. Yeah. So it's just that plus. Okay. And this cohomology group is defined with respect to that operator. That one there. Still a little confused. So the RA is a derivative on. But, but lambda i 
is valued where? On the moduli space? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, so lambda is a function of both the coordinates on the clavier and the parameters in the moduli space. Okay. Yeah. And it's so a, it's but it's a form in the directions along the moduli space. Yes. Okay. So um, why confuse you with a thousand words when a picture will do? Um, so I guess this is a little cartoon. Here is your moduli space. You define a connect. So over that moduli space, you have a family of five thousand bundles, and you want to somehow put a connection around that family. So lambda, um, lambda is this connection on all the different components of the moduli space that the endomorphisms in a bundle and the yeah, we'll do. Yeah, so for the moment I've, I've forgot about those and just fixed the clavier oh, okay. and looked at bundle definitions. Oh, right, okay. But it's, it's, it's almost trivial to extend to the other um, So it's a little bit confusing because you have you know, bundles upon bundles. Upon bundles. And, and, and this thing here will also have a bundle structure as well. Um, okay, so the other comment I just want to make is that this moduli space admits a complex structure. So that just means I can define holomorphic covariant derivatives. And what you discover is that curly A depends holomorphically on parameters in this sentence. I take the covariant derivative with respect to wi bar, that is, it is zero. So, so, so basically, we're, we're almost done in the sense that we've, we've done all the hard work, we've discovered a nice parameterization of uh, this cohomology group, and that then gives us the KK results to do the dimensional reduction. So before I do that, um, just this, I guess it's related to the questions of Aaron and Andy. Um, so it's kind of interesting to study what this, what this object is. I mean, to me it was a bit unusual you have this connection on the moduli space. So one nice way of viewing it is to form forms. So introduce forms on the moduli space. So here is an operator. Um, DW, again, is just the, the direction of the moduli space. So you have a covariant derivative um, form, an exterior form, and then we just form one form, lambda. Then the covariant derivative just becomes this object here, so what does this object mean? So it turns out if you define a big A, bold face A, uh, which is just the sum of the connection in the directions along the R and in the direction along the moduli space, and form similarly a big exterior derivative, then you can define a big field strength in the usual sort of way. It's just dA plus A squared. Uh, you find the field strength along the R. That's, that's the usual thing. You find a field strength with legs along the moduli space, and then you have an off-diagonal term, which is our covariant derivative. Yeah. Uh, there's a name for this, right? Because an identical construction appears in the nodes with I. Yes. So, so, so this is known as a universal bundle, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it it appears in the math literature, in the, for example, in the ETS thing and index theorem. Um, and the places I know best is in a paper by Gauntlet where he uh, is studying quantum volume of modular space, which is probably really yeah. Yeah. Um, So, okay, so that was sort of reassuring to discover that we could bring that. Okay, so we can now do our dimensional reduction after all this song and dance. So what do we have to do? We have to take our KK ansatz and plug it into the action and integrate over the clavier, just like we did to uh, the historical case. And you get, again, these kinetic terms, which are now functions of these moduli fields, and you have a metric. So the metric is this. It's the integral of omega squared. Omega is the k to form, so it's two form. And you have trace times two covariant derivatives, one with respect to W and the other with respect to W bar. Okay, so this is perhaps less mysterious um, if you write it as the natural inner product 
of these two guys, which you can do because this is a Kähler manifold. Um, okay, so this metric has some nice properties. It's manifestly commissioned. Um, and you can also show that it's Kähler. And so that just involves differentiating and then performing some algebraic gymnastics uh, to show that the, uh, this relation is satisfied. It's a Kähler commission. And you can also show that it agrees with Barker is a metric on basic definitions. And so this, this metric uh, was uh, written down by Kobayashi in the 80s in really what was a gauge dependent form. So you fixed a gauge slice, looks, looked at small fluctuations around that gauge slice, and said there is a metric which is the natural net product. So what we've constructed is essentially that metric, except perhaps in a more gauge invariant fashion. Does the uh, curvature of the metric have some meaning to this uh, kind of curvature of which metric? Of that metric. Ah, does it have a meaning? Yes. The why you the curvature is so symmetric? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, that's a good question. I don't know what it means. Uh, it doesn't arise in the effective action anyway, probably, right? It does. It does? For Fermi terms. For Fermi, For Fermi terms, yes. Then we should know something about that. It's not a good answer. You should know something, but, but I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I should know. Not even working on it. Uh, um, you can say, like, you can say, it's not too, I mean, it's not too hard technically. You just, you can do it. You can write down what it is in terms of this, these variables here. Um, at the moment, I'm just trying to get the metric correct. That turns out to be the main one. Hey, the metric is clear. You will have seen how formula for the kind of potential corresponding. That's a great question. So, it's very tempting to try and find the Kähler potential. <laughs> right, so, here is the obvious one the integral of trace A to A. The problem is, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because, uh, it doesn't work seemingly unless you impose an additional condition on. So, so previously we thought this was a gauge fixing condition. Um, alas, that seems not to be the case. So, for example, Lorentz gauge on a compact space fixes all the gauge degrees of freedom. It looks like this. This guy here would amount to setting these two terms individually to zero, which would seemingly open and strain the potential. So, um, it seems to be hard to write down a Kähler potential, and this is very disappointing because it has. Um, uh, later on, it, 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 it used to have a nice interpretation. I mean, I guess you so, so you know that uh, Kähler potential exists. Yeah. Uh, but you're having trouble writing it as a nice local integral. Yeah. Right. So we talked to Nigel Hitchin about this for a while, and he said, "Yeah, it's probably something horrible." Which wasn't very specific about, but um, I mean, it, it, it certainly does exist because it's Kähler, but we can't seem to find. Is this supposed to be a local expression that exists in Kähler potential? Um, global constructions. Does it exist as a local yeah. integral or a local yeah. integral yeah, the, yeah. function? No, so not. It's, it's not even. Not you can't even get a local sort of expression for it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, essentially, what happens is if. If you were to take this, for example, differentiate, then you've got partial derivatives hitting both of these guys in some complicated way. Uh, you need to somehow turn those into covariant derivatives, and you end up with what you want plus extra junk, and that extra junk is essentially proportional. No, no, this one doesn't work. I take your word for it. But the so-called thing, the one which is guaranteed to exist, yeah. If we found it, would it be guaranteed to be some local expression, or could it be non-local? Local. I see. You mean local on the on the on the target. Yeah. Oh, that, that. I don't know. No, I, I, I don't. I don't think necessarily local. On the yeah. yeah. Okay. So the case potential for the complex structure in Kähler moduli is certainly not local. Type space. It's also an integral over the part yeah. But it'd be it'd be local in on. Okay. So, so so far, what have we done? 
we've essentially fixed the metric for a fixed clavier. Now you just want to generalize this by allowing the fun of the, the clavier to be. So put these knobs on the clavier, I'm also allowed to twin them. So, so again, it's a little cartoon. Um, you fix the metric in this vertical direction. You already essentially know the metric in the horizontal direction. And we want to ask the question, what happens? So we do that by first allowing the complex structure, the clavier to vary. And you essentially want to repeat the same procedure. So the main task is defining your covariant derivative. Now you have to uh, take into account the fact that when you vary the complex structure of the manifold, what you call a 0-1 form changes. So 0-1 will then have some non-zero pieces. And you take that into account by an extra term, which is written there. And then once you've done that, you uh, use that to parameterize your fluctuations. So now we have fluctuations in the gauge field, in terms of complex structure and bundle, and metric. And you just repeat the exercise. So here is the end result. Um, what does it look like? Well, um, so GIJ bar was the Kobayashi metric that I mentioned before. So that's a metric on the bundle pieces. I have sort of a bundle type structure where the bundle is defined by some off diagonal pieces, which are called curly C. So these have an expression here. And then I've got a base, which is a special geometry. So that metric is, is, is also a condition, and you can also show it's Kähler. Um, and it seems to have this vibration structure uh, generated here, which is sort of what I've already said. So that's, that's what you want to think about, building up that space set. So, so complex structure and bundle parameters seem to work quite nicely. Um, you might want to ask some questions about what happens away from the standard embedding, uh, in which you need to take into account that when you have a bundle in some field strength, in general that will obstruct complex structure deformations. So in particular, you'll generate some zero two field strength. And so again, vary the complex structure to zero gets some, uh, sorry, one one gets a little bit of zero two and a little bit of two zero. And you need to take into account when can you uh, modify the bundle appropriately to get rid of that. And so that is happens when the fluctuation is del bar closed, uh, which is equivalent to this condition here, the exact in del bar. So, um, there's a fancy language for this in terms of I think, the construction by a tier. So he basically told you, look, I can construct this bundle Q, and its cohomology exactly describes deformations of complex structure and bundle, so that you preserve the homomorphic structure. So you, in general, complex structure gets reduced to something I call M D pi star, which is in here. <coughs> and the metric on that thing is presumably the appropriate restriction of the entire complex structure model space to that something. Like yeah, so that that's just saying um, in general you, you, know, you still expect some type of complex structure deformation to the Clavier uh, together with uh, these bundle deformations. So So we've allowed, so okay, so now we've written down a metric on the complex structure of moduli space to get with that bundle moduli space. Finally, what about Kähler? Remember, Kähler's like the volume together with B field. And you can already tell that Kähler's on a slightly different footing from complex structure. So on the Kobayashi metric, which I wrote up before, we have a 1 over B and an omega squared. So none of these things depend on bundle nor do they depend on complex structure, but they do depend on Kähler. So GIJ bar is defined implicitly with the choice of Kähler class. It's a little complicated life. So at this point, I, it, it's, it's useful to be explicit about alpha prime. So what I'm going to do is expand all my background fields in alpha prime. 
happened down here, as well as the small fluctuations. And I'll always denote the small fluctuations by a lowercase letter, and the superscript denotes the order in which you read this perturbation. Okay, so we now let's be a little bit careful about how we're doing this reduction, and in particular, what do the equations of motion tell you? So at zero quarter in alpha prime, we've already mentioned that we need our manifold to be rigid. This guy must vanish. And if you're looking at deformations of that guy, these amounts are setting zero modes of the linear Lewis operator. At next order in alpha prime, you introduce additional terms. So, for example, the background metric has, in general, a source term. Okay. So this is uh, f is the field strength of the, the bundle, and r is the Riemann tensor. So in general, this guy is non-zero, except at the standard embedding when it is actually zero. Okay. Um, similarly, when you're looking at deformations of this guy, you'll get a deformation of the Lignerovitz operator itself, to get a bit G1, and a source term. Okay. So the key point here is that zero modes of Lignerovitz, which are these guys up here, if they occur in higher orders, they essentially amount to redefinition of modular ideas. So without loss of generality, you can take these guys here to have no zero modes. And that's encapsulated by saying, I want these integrals here to vanish. So omega 1 is the perturbation of the k level. It's another useful fact in our, in our reduction that uh, provided you appropriately gauge fix symmetric, the dilettante's actually constant to alpha prime cube, which is much higher than the order to, in which we're working. So we're always going to work to the first order in alpha prime. Okay, so then similar comments apply for the B field. So here the equation of motion is the dagger of H is zero, again up to uh, order alpha prime squared where H is this combination of uh, B in the Chen Simons form. So we just go through it order by order. H to zeroth order is DB zero. Provided you, again, appropriately gauge fits B, so B is if you shift by exact forms, um, uh, deformations of B solve uh, the zero modes of this Laplacian. So they can be expanded in a basis of harmonic uh, forms. To next order, you have something more interesting. Um, uh, so now we need to take into account this Chern Simons, this Chern Simons forms. And so the first order correction to H is given as a sum of two terms. So tau one here is uh, this guy here. C is this guy here. And the nice thing about these two pieces is that they're individually gauge invariant. Um, Now gauge fix in a similar way uh, the freedom to shift B1 by exact forms, except we want to shift, if we want to gauge fix with this condition. And in that case, the equation of motion at first order amounts to uh, a Laplacian for tau 1 with some non zero source term. And then you apply the same logic that zero modes just modify moduli fields, so you can take tau 1 to be a problem. So that means that this integral here vanishes. So given that, a little aside, let's do our reduction. So as I mentioned, we're going to be working the first order in alpha prime. We can now use that information to write down the ansatz, that is, zeroth order deformations are expanded in terms of these harmonic 1-1 one -one forms. And then uh, we can form a complex combination. And it turns out we don't actually need any of the, the explicit expression for G1 and B1 because of the orthogonality problem. Okay, so you need all the terms in the action where they would show up are already zero. Oh, yeah, I, yeah I'll, I'll show you in a second. 
So the final step is to introduce our covariant derivative, but we already know how to do that. We've already done it twice. Um, so here it is here. And uh, there's our KK onto it. So we're just expanding into these bases for these couple of things. So now you take this and you plug it in. So for example, the reduction of the Ricci scalar is the zeroth order term, which we've already seen. The GRS is, is this guy here, together with the complex structure guy. But there are no alpha prime corrections. And that's because the first order correction to the Kähler form was orthogonal to the zero matrix. Okay, so any corrections to this metric come in at order alpha prime squared. The same thing will happen in the reduction of h squared. So in the reduction of h squared, um, we get a zeroth order term, which is the inner product of b0. We get a first order term, which is the inner product of b0 and tau1. But because of the orthogonality property, this guy vanishes. So all the corrections wind up at alpha prime squared. Okay, so you can then put that all together and write down a metric. And here it is. So we did quite a lot of work, and it turns out to have a fairly straightforward structure. Um, so it's, 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 this seems to be relatively unchanged from um, a complex structure case. So we just have this vibration structure. Now it's a, a vibration over the complex structure and Kähler moduli spaces of the phi r. So you, in particular, it means you have some mixing between um, those two spaces at, at, at order alpha prime. Uh, you can be very explicit about, about the metrics, so we've seen this one here, that's the Kobayashi metric. These are our uh, off-diagonal pieces, and these guys here are the familiar special geometry pieces. On the you, you, you have order alpha prime square terms, it looks like, in the S squared. Yes, yes. So, uh, but I thought you're not computing alpha prime square stuff. Uh, what happened? No, I'm not. Um, I'm just saying that uh, that this guy here is correct, plus alpha prime squared. So if you were to expand this out, then indeed it looks like you get alpha prime squared. I should neglect but them, really, those alpha, probably, or not. Sorry? I mean, should I discard the alpha prime squared terms and I expand? Yes. yes. That's what that, I That's what do. you're instructed oh, okay. to Okay, okay, yes. okay. But it has, but, but nonetheless it's true, you can factorize it. So you have the cross terms or something? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's a product of two cross terms. Okay. Um, but this metric has uh, it has a bit of an issue. So first of all, I've been mentioned several times for a good reason. This moduli space metric should be Kähler, and we've already seen it's Kähler with respect to the complex structure and bundle deformations. But the same is not true for the bundle metric. So if I differentiate the Kobayashi metric, so if I differentiate the Kobayashi metric with respect to a Kähler parameter, I get you know, what I should do on the right-hand side, but I get an additional term. And that additional term came from the fact that I have omega squared and 1 over v here. Okay. So nowhere in the reduction do you see a term like this. So we've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to let you work and, and figure out this solution for me. Um, so th this, is, this is a problem. Um, it seems to suggest that there's an additional correction or an additional term in the metric that we're missing. Um, but not found. Um, and in particular, the, the system's very constrained. So once you impose local symmetries and gauge invariants, there aren't too many things you can write down. Um, well, why should the metric be Kähler? Do you have evidence for well, if you want n equals 1, d equals 4, super symmetry. Oh, that's a result added to any order. Uh, yeah, that, any that, that's, that's just super symmetry. Okay. I see. Are there Sorry? Maybe of your cardinals. Yeah, that, 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 could, that could be. That's one possible thing. Um, so I've played around with, with that. I haven't managed to get it to work. But indeed, you could. The, my definition of t, for example, um, the other option is the definition of Kähler covariant derivative needs to be modified for something. And that 
they might be doing this. Okay, so everyone likes a seminar definition too. <laughs> so this is so so um, what have we done? Well, um, I think we've taken some steps at least towards doing this dimensional reduction and using that to write down a, a metric um, on the moduli space, perturbability of the prime. The main exercise was introducing this parameterization of uh, the gauge field. Um, you, so, so you've also done it for the matter field metric, it's not written up here because you don't really learn anything new, but you can do it. Um, then it's very natural to ask questions about, uh, beyond this Cayley issue I've just mentioned, you know, uh, what, what sort of remnants of special geometry um, are, is there, can you learn anything by uh, mirror symmetry, what role the quantum corrections play, you know, so what are the analogous statements that we saw? Complex structure and Kähler geometry, Kähler moduli space geometries. Um, uh, they had some nice structures. Does this persist um, to this situation? So with that, I will stop there. Thank you. So, questions for John. Hmm. What are the implications for group theoretical structure of the resulting effective action? Um, how do you mean group theoretical? I mean the, the nitty gritties of how, what, what are the gate symmetries and so on and so forth. When you say bundle deformation, you, yeah. you, you modify your answers for the gauge fields and so on. But are they still, uh, for example, SQ3 valued or yes. what's so going I, on in that part? Yeah. So I don't do any, because they're really all small deformations, I don't sort of change the gauge fields that much. Bigger structures like um, it's based on gauge symmetry. So, so it's still E6, for it's, example. It's still, all still E6. Yeah. E6. Um, you can think about uh, you can think about Higgs, for example. Um, uh, that would require, but for me, it, it's all small definitions. Small, well, by small I mean sort of small enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they're not infinitesimal, but they're, so they're still fine. You still don't change topological issues or representations. So your results amount to saying that you change your internal space? Yes, just like small deformation in internal of space. The internal space. And, and how does that manifest itself in the interactions? In the interactions. Yeah. For example, the number of families or generations and stuff like that, they, they don't change, do they? They don't, uh, yeah, so I don't do All the global numbers. invariants will be uh, they'll, left they'll, invariant. That's right, they'll all be preserved. Um, at least to sort of uh -huh. what I've done. But you could think about what, you know, can so I, can that's I... Not, that's not clear, right? Uh, you, you could turn on in principal masses for 27, 27 bars as you go on the 2-2 two, two locus. Uh, you wouldn't right, see but the, the, the index. The, the index would yeah, change. The index, of course, yeah. doesn't care. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not modif I'm not going far enough in the eternal geometry to change some um, topological structure. Oh, is the fact that Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, if I had a Kähler potential, then you know, so so just let's dream for a second. Um, so suppose I write down a Kähler potential, which is the sum of the special geometry guy. So if you if you took this as your Kähler potential, 
and you define appropriately your Kähler coordinates, then you would just differentiate appropriately and construct a metric in the usual way. Um, so, so the answer is to the question I don't really know, but look, if you knew, okay, if you knew the Kähler potential and you knew the coordinates, then yes, in principle it would fix it. Because by definition you've constructed the Kähler sure. potential. Yeah. Um, but, uh, the problem is this, yeah, it's quite hard. So it sort of comes back also to the question.